I have the uh, pleasure to um, introduce uh, Rolf and Lindsay. Um, they're going to talk a little bit um, about um, the Olympics and 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 some of the learning um, from from that um, for uh, the second screen viewing and and mobile. Um, as a way of introduction, uh, Rolf Swinton is the uh, co-founder and chief research officer of Reality Mind. Um, he's been driving substantial bottom line growth uh, through strategic application of mobile research. Um, he's an expert in mobile consumer behavior, insight and innovation, and he's led develop of a range of uh, products over the course of his career. Uh, Lindsay is uh, senior research um, uh, director at NBC Universal. She's been at NBC Universal for about five years, and prior to that, she was at Nielsen. So in an effort to try to get us back on track, we're going we're gonna to forge ahead. Let me introduce Rolf and Lindsay. I'll try to stand in the middle. There we go. Here we go. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. So a little over a year and a half ago, we went over and met with Rolf and um, Brian Katz over at TiVo. And we said to them we wanted to be able to measure cross-platform research for the Rio games. It's a unique opportunity where we have 17 days of viewer engagement, where we really get the opportunity to look at uh, media consumption now and be able to understand where it might be going in the future. So we went over to Rolf and we said, we want to be able to measure the full extent of consumption on the individual level for the Olympics across television, mobile, tablet, and social. For social, this was the first time that NBC was making original content available. So we really wanted to understand the impact that social had this time versus past. So I'm going to turn it over to Rolf to talk about the panel and the methodology, and then we'll get into the data. So just to, to give you a couple minutes, I think we've seen a lot of really interesting data so far here, but we thought it'd be useful to go a little bit into how the, how the sausage factory worked in this case, just to understand how we get the data we're going to share with you. So it was really important here in, the, um, in terms of methodology, we were recruiting, aiming to get about um, six or 700 people. We ended up with uh, a little over 800 people. Lots of people were excited to take part in Olympic-oriented research. And we were looking specifically for people who were going to watch the Olympics. This was not an unbiased general population sample because we were looking specifically wanting to get people who are going to help us get more of a glimpse in the future as to what was going to happen. And so we were getting people who wanted to watch the games um, either regularly or at every chance that they could. And also people who are self-described tech forward people. Right? We wanted people who were going to be, who were embracing technology. We didn't want rejectors again because the purpose of this is to really see how people are going to be using the latest and greatest across all the different platforms. And importantly, too, as Lindsay was saying, we definitely had to get people who were using social media. We wanted to understand that relationship that's come up in so many points today around how does social media and TV work together. And finally, we were looking for people across ranges. And um, we weren't looking just to say, OK, let's great, let's get some millennials, or let's just get uh, easy, older folks. We actually wanted to get a really good spread. And so we worked hard to get a really good balance uh, across, across the range of people. And, and we succeeded at that. Um, and then. There's actually, and just on how we actually built it, I thought, just let's take you through, because to actually capture this kind of data across these platforms takes uh, really four different pieces to, to do this well. And just to talk you through this, at one point, the very beginning of the process here, you actually have to focus on how you're going to build really good samples. So we talked about the kind of people, but it's not just recruiting them. You need to make sure you had really high quality um, uh, management tools and people ready to work with people to get cross-media data because it takes encouragement. This is not a super uh, light, you know, just forget, get people to sign up and never talk to them kind of process. Um, you need to really engage panelists in a productive way. And also, as this come up a bit in discussion is, um, over the last few days, how do you make sure you get people to opt in? Well, we've done this, we've, we've done this and approached this with a way to make sure, with complete transparency, here's what you're going to do. Here's the data you're going to share across all these platforms. Here's how we're going to use it so there's no, uh, so there's no confusion on anyone's parts. So you get the panelists in, but then it's how do you actually get the data from them? And this requires a number of different tools. Our focus here was single source data. We wanted to make sure we knew exactly who was consuming what. So we wanted to make sure we could get their TV. So we're getting television data from their set-top boxes. But just getting a set-top box data, of course, gives us just household data. What we cared about was the individual data. So on each person's mobile device and their tablets and their PCs, we also put meters on there. 
And on their phone, we were using another tool called Audio Content Recognition, or ACR, which is listening out all the time for broadcast content. And so you'd know if someone was watching television, that given TV set, when the ACR content would be matching, the ACR data would be matching the set-top box data. So together, then you get a match, you know, okay, so-and-so was in front of the TV at that given time. Um, as we said, we were measuring, measuring off their tablets and phablets, laptops and PCs, and we weren't just getting the home laptop or PC, but also, importantly, the work machine. And that was important because a lot of Olympic viewing is maybe slightly surreptitious viewing at the workplace, but how do we get that? Those machines were locked down. So there we were able to send a beacon, essentially getting people to click on a link to register that computer so that we could pull the specific Omniture files linked to that. So really it's this part, these different data points, set-top box data, ACR data, device meter data, uh, server-side data, but all linked back to a specific individual. We then had to take all that data, be able to process it, and come up with unduplicated numbers about how people were watching TV, how they're consuming video across these different platforms, and, um, and be able to get that all in, in, a, in a simplified way and finally, to deliver these results on a timely basis. Um, the folks at NBC set us a very high bar where they wanted to have clean process data back within 72 hours, and we were really aiming forward to try to do that within a 24-hour basis. So that was, the, that was the engine we set up, the people we set up, and let's now get into what we were able to produce with all this. So first, before we get into what we found out this time, let's just take a look back in time. So we have a little bit of, forget that radio thing there. <laughs> so if you look back to Athens in 2004, this is before mobile measurement. So we had 100% of consumption consumed on a television. If you look just eight years later, this is the start of when we had our WAP and Map and apps available. And we saw that there was a little bit of digital that started to take place at 6%. But still, te television was at 94%, and television was still king. In London, this was the first time that we saw major shifts in consumer behavior. We had more content available on our websites. We had more content available on the two apps that we made available. And we saw that it actually took up 27% of overall Olympic consumption. It was also the first time we made VOD available, and that really just hit it at about 1%. So looking at Rio to see what happened this time around, we see that television was still a majority of the consumption with 69%. And digital was, grew 1% to be 28%. But social was the first, this was the first time we had original social behavior, uh, social content made available. And we saw that it took up 4% of overall consumption. And VOD hung in there with the same 1%. So what we do with this data is we'll use this data to help plan future Olympics. So as we start to plan Pyeongchang, that I can't spell, um, we will start to use this data to understand the shifts that we expect to see and plan for that. So now looking at the devices that we use to follow the Olympics. Just let this build here for a second. So television only. People that only sat down and watched the Olympics on television was 4%. People that did TV plus one other device was 56%. TV plus two devices was 34%, and TV plus three devices was at 6%. But what's really interesting is that as people consume on more devices, their time spent with the Olympics increases. So we'll see that with TV only, people spent 3.6 hours per day watching the Olympics. When they added in their one other device, it went down to 3.2 hours. And again, the reason for that is when you think about mobile content, it's short content. You're watching a 30-second clip here and there. It's not like you're sitting on your couch to watch an hour of primetime television. But when you get to three point, uh, th TV plus two devices, it's 4.8 hours. And when you get to TV plus three devices, these are our real Olympic enthusiasts. They're watching almost six hours a day of Olympic content. So looking at all of that consumption across the mobile devices, it's interesting to just take a look and see which devices are they actually using. So 50% of it was done on a smartphone. It's the device that we had people, that people have on them. It's also the device that we asked people to keep on them for the meter. Um, tablet and phablet was 17%, and laptop and desktop was 33%. What's interesting about this, and Rolf and I kind of had a debate on it yesterday, was the phablet. So phablet, I would consider it a phone. It's the bigger screens that you have. But in this, for this Olympics, it was considered part of the tablet phase. So this is something that going forward, I would expect to only increase that smartphone number going forward to the next Olympics. 
So this is looking at it on a whole of total Olympic consumption. But it really, what's really interesting is when you break it down by age to see the differences. So when you look at the millennials, 18 to 34, you see that 60% of their digital time spent was on a smartphone. It's not really surprising as people are taking, these are the people that are on the go, they've grown up with the smartphone, this is what they are using to rely on a, on a day-to-day -day basis. 25% is on a smartphone, on a PC laptop, and 15% is on a tablet. When you get to the 35 to 54, it follows similar patterns. It's 51% on a smartphone, PC, laptop, 35%. These are people that are probably working a little bit more, so they're using their laptops to check out consumption throughout the day. And tablets at 14%. Where we see the real big shift is when you look at 55 plus. 55 plus, you see that their smartphone goes down to 40%, and 33% is spent on a PC laptop, and 27% is their tablet. These are people that are sitting home, they have their tablets with them, they're consuming the games, and this is a real big, this is something really interesting that we'll look to use in the future because we have to really understand how people are consuming and make sure that we make available content to everybody that wants to watch the games. So next we're gonna talk about social and simultaneous usage. And when I talk about simultaneous usage, I just wanna be clear that we're talking about people that are following Olympic content on multiple devices. So this isn't people that are just checking their Facebook page. This is you know, people that are actually engaging with um, Olympic content. So when we look at simultaneous viewing, we see that 66% of people that are using their smartphone and a television. So this isn't, again, not surprising. People are sitting at home, they're sitting through a live sporting event, and they're watching content, but they're also on their phones, checking out the newest posts. What's, what are people saying about it? What, what are people talking? Uh, what's trending? 26% um, is TV plus uh, tablet, and then 7% is uh, TV plus laptop. When we look at time of day with simultaneous viewing, it's not surprising that most simultaneous behavior occurs during prime time. It's when viewing levels are the highest and it's when people are sitting and engaging with their social behavior um, or their devices. With our panel, we saw that 74% of our panel engaged in simultaneous viewing. The other peak that you'll see here is during the 12 to 2 hour during lunchtime when people are probably checking out what's happening throughout the day and getting their updates. Um, because this was basically a live Olympics, there were things going on during the day that people wanted to keep, um, keep up with during the day. So um, the lunchtime hours were when people also were able to engage. So if you think about what's, what we found to take that forward is how did that um, social media behavior vary by platform? Again, we're, we're just come down just to, to the few top platforms we found that, oops, sorry, wrong way here. So first, um, our hosts here, Facebook, were definitely the most used platform across it. But so you see that shape of that curve really is that almost identical to the, to the TV curve we saw in terms of viewership. This is the same kind of activity for so many of these people, these things working together. Um, but very similarly, Twitter, there again, slightly different use, but just as much following the shape of TV viewing people were really using these in combination to a, to a large degree. And um, you know, interestingly too, uh, uh, Instagram, also a big second screen simultaneous platform. What's interesting is we start to move down to smaller platforms, but interestingly, BuzzFeed and Snapchat also consistent, but look a very different kind of usage profile um, throughout the day. Um, and again, simultaneous viewing. But if we take that and we start to look at this in terms of age, very different profile. So. Here's just a look at, um, we, we grouped social media users into two age categories, 18 to 34, 35 to 64 year olds, just to get a sense of the differences. And you see here, Facebook definitely uh, owns, owns the older market. Without a question, nearly 90% nearly uh, penetration of that group using these when they're watching and engaging with the Olympics, never mind the other times of the day. So incredibly high utilization um, of Facebook by the, by the older. But, nearly half also by, by, the, my, by the millennial group. Um, Twitter is, is right in there as well, nearly 50% um, with both groups. BuzzFeed though, you see really strong position. People, younger people are really using BuzzFeed a lot as a primary news source and information source throughout, whereas for older users, not such a big, uh, not such a big tool. Instagram again, much more visual tool, much more popular with younger users. And then Snapchat, you know, growing from, from nowhere to, uh, to a significant position there, again, with the uh, 
with the youngest viewers. So you can't look at social media as a monolithic thing, not that I'm sure anyone in this room would, but we're seeing very different kinds of usage footprints and behaviors. And if you think about that, um, just going back to what we saw, for example, presented by Facebook earlier, um, just to add in some, if we think about well, how might you be thinking about better using TV and social together in ways? Well, just to give you a sense of how TV and social behavior can broke, we took our total viewership, and we broke it just into a couple of tercels here. And this is just showing you, this line here is showing average time spent on Facebook, the Facebook app by all TV viewers. So you're seeing this thing sort of bobbling along across our total population of around five or so minutes a day on average. But if we look at the high TV viewers, we see this range, sort of five, 10 minutes um, range with the medium TV users. Interestingly, a very similar pattern of behavior, sort of consistent small amounts of usage. But if we go to the lowest tercile of TV viewers, we see quite a significant more Facebook usage. So there's definitely different kinds of segments. And this is a super crude segmentation here. There's many ways you could be cutting this more finely, but it starts to show that these are not, this is not one monolithic group of people. Social media users are not at all just a consistent. But we can take it still one step further as well. Just to give you a teaser, let's just think about if you were trying to optimize that relationship between TV ad exposure and digital ad exposure, what would that look like? Now, this, this particular project did not focus on measuring advertising at all. It just happened we were picking up broadcast ad exposure during the Olympics. And this is just showing you top campaigns in total and the frequency. So yellow bars, uh, ads that were shown, that were, that were seen by our respondents once, um, two times or five times over the course of the Olympics, or on one particular day what the frequency was for that particular day. Now, from what we just heard earlier with Facebook folks, you could actually think about, you can actually, how do you best optimize in the course of an entire Olympics, in the course of a day, um, or in any other given kinds of campaigns or times of the year, but you can start to think about how to best optimize across them. But to do that, we thought we'd take a step down in detail. So going from large aggregate numbers, let's, to really understand what's going on, we thought it'd be helpful to take a look at some snapshots of individual viewer behavior on a given day, because this really helps start to tell a story of the kinds of trends that are really gonna be shaping mobile behavior, and it's this, as its tool as a second screen um, uh, going forward. So what we've done is we've stripped out all the other sort of general website use, other app use, there's all sorts of other things going on. If we were to prevent, present that, it would be an incredibly complex and rich picture. But for the sake of today, we thought, let's just look very specifically at a handful of profiles and a few a days in the life of some people and, um, and help you tell a story about how are people now using their mobile in conjunction with viewing the Olympics on, on television. So as a first one, um, We've got two different people here, uh, a man and a woman. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look for, pull the group here to think about uh, which is which. Here we have a person watching a solid set of uh, the Olympics here on Instagram, then on Facebook a couple of times at home. Meanwhile, their companion here watching lots of TV, but in and out uh, from uh, BuzzFeed to Facebook to Instagram to Facebook to BuzzFeed to Instagram to Twitter to Facebook to Twitter to Facebook to Twitter to Facebook to Facebook to um, going through. Clearly, this person has a uh, massive case of the uh, FOMO disease here, right? <laughs> this is definitely, uh, they're, 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 they're deeply. But let me ask you, uh, show of hands, um, how many people, I'm going to ask you which one of these is the male and which one's the female. How many people think the top person is a female? How many people think it's a male? Interestingly, so this group generally thinks that this is it, that uh, women are more multitaskers than male. Well, in fact, this is in fact can I here in this case, you know, much more of a, of a single task person than women, very heavy heavy multitasker. But you can see, same people sitting there together on the sofa watching the Olympics for sustained, totally different second screen experiences. So when you think about, you know, household level data for TV viewing, well, they're watching the same program here, but radically different second screen, radically different experience on their on their devices. Um, and how to think about interacting with them and serving them. Let's take a look at, um, let's look here at a woman. Now there's a bigger question here too, which is, is the second screen, is the mobile or the tablet um, taking away television time? Well, this, is, this, this gives us a really inter interesting insight as to what's actually going on here. So you'll note here, we're able to measure not only in-home, but also out-of-home activity. And you notice the out-of-home stuff that we're measuring here is marked with that red line starting at about 10 o'clock um, in the morning going through to 5 p.m. So that's time when we know that person is not in their house. They're still being exposed, though, to media. So they might be their workplace or somewhere where they're, they're seeing the TVs on, the Olympics are playing, um, and they're still doing other things. They're on Twitter, they're on Pinterest, um, or on, sorry, on Instagram. But 
they actually take some time, they jump on to watch some live streaming of NBC, something very specifically they want to watch some gymnastics. So this woman's there, she's watching the gymnastics. Now you think, okay, is that it? Have we lost that opportunity to actually draw her in and get her more engaged still? Well, no. As we see, later that evening, she's home, she's watching the Olympics on TV, and she tunes in and is able to watch the same gymnastics thing, but this time in a curated thing on the big screen, enjoying that. So we're seeing here, again, it's not about replacement. It's actually, it's increasing viewership. She's able to enjoy that same performance again. So the role of mobile here could be very positive in actually building the audience, building the opportunity to represent content, to re-engage that person around the very same thing by just thinking about how to show it differently, in their case, in a, in a, in a more dramatic way, perhaps. Finally, let's look at here at a totally different kind of profile. Um, sort of digital snacker. This guy is really into consuming a lot of content in the way he wants to. So you can see he's watching some TV at different times of the day. Um, he's jumping in, watching, so watching some things on his tablet. He's doing some stuff that he's watching. You see from 10 in the morning through to 2 p.m., he's watching TV, but he's also on his tablet. And he's busy there looking at a lot of clips. So there might be the main thing that's being broadcast and is interesting, but he's jumping through from road races to looking at a bit of news about the Olympics to watching a specific uh, competition to seeing what John Kerry has to say at the opening ceremonies and through and through. 15 clips being consumed over a couple of hours. This guy is very actively curating his Olympic experience while he's still watching the big screen, watching the main programming going on. And this sort of thing shows not only having the capacity to actually consume a lot more content exactly how that person wants to do it. Um, another t quiz here is going to be, um, I'd like you all to think about what's the age of this particular um, consumer, what's this person doing? This person, very different profile, very light TV viewer. Very light TV viewer, but this person is definitely very engaged in the Olympics. So you can see, clearly this person at certain times during the day is able to jump in and very quickly look at some things that they're very interested in. You see, um, looking at this, at tennis, at um, sports, going in, jumping in, and looking at the outcomes of very specific competitions that are particularly interesting to them. Watching a bit of TV in, in the evening when they've got some time, to sit down and relax, but definitely keeping up the sport all through the day. So what is this person? Is this person millennial? Is this, so I'm going to throw up a couple of things. Think about it. Is this person fall into the, uh, into the uh, 18 to 34 camp, the 35 uh, plus camp, or, or more? Who would say this person's a, a millennial, 18 to 34? Who thinks this person is uh, 35 plus? In fact, this is a slightly trick question that uh, this person's actually 68 years old, so they're off the scales entirely. But uh, for me personally, I would have, I would, you know, looking at this, I think this person's a millennial. This is really, this is a short attention span jumping in, but not. And this really goes to show that the, the technology is letting people live the lives they want. And you cannot think about people just because of their age about having a certain digital, certain media consumption behavior. It's more about, I think it's as much as a, an attitudinal thing. And this person, Technology is helping them fit in the Olympics into their lives. They're a big Olympic fan. They like to enjoy it wherever they can. But it's just enabling them to be able to act on a desire to see things when they can actually fit it into their day. So um, in summary, the key things um, that we've come to take away from this. Clearly, um, the, some of the fundamental questions here. Is mobile, is technology taking away the Olympic audience? Well, clearly not. We see that um, again and again through these different examples using tablets, PCs, mobile, all these gives more opportunities to enjoy the content, more opportunities to engage, and can be driving back people back to main television viewing. So it's really an, it's an aggregation, um, it's an enhancement, it's increasing the audience overall. Definitely it's as much also as an at-home as an at-home experience. This enables people to enjoy things really where they want to, when they want to. One of the things we're certainly seeing, as, as Lindsay mentioned before, that the, the, we're seeing on average, a reduction in tablet usage, but that's really being replaced by the phablet. So for all of you watching where things are going, we certainly think the phablet is just is going to become the device. It is letting you have a tablet experience, but on the go. And that really does drive a big change in, in behavior. We see the simultaneous usage is definitely driving engagement. You're not seeing people, these are not people with, who are bored of watching the Olympics. They're seeing people here who, when they're really engaged in the content, want to be able to go deeper. They just want to be able to go deeper in their own ways, and certainly, if you have all this technology, if you can get access to all this content on these different screens as you want to, you will consume more. And so these things work together. I think ultimately, too, though, we start to see the beginning now of how you can start to link 
TV, digital, social, think about the marketing opportunities here, are true opportunity to drive behavior. And again, our study didn't go there, but you can start to see if we take some of this, the cases we've heard today or from yesterday from Oracle, today from Facebook, about the opportunity of linking TV, social, digital together, there's a lot greater opportunity. If you can really understand how people are using these tools, how they're fitting into their lives, to make much more effective advertising overall. Yeah, I, I mean, so we will take all of this research that we learned, and this is what we're going to use to help build the, the Olympics coming, coming up in, um, in Pyeongchang. And uh, we look forward to doing future research to show you guys more about consumer behavior. So let's give Lindsay and Rolf a, a nice hand. Um, we're going to try to keep this on schedule. Lindsay and Rolf will be around um, for, during the lunch break and stuff like that for questions. Um, from the ARF standpoint, it's, it's nice when you have a lot of different speakers up and, and, and all the data kind of comes together and supports each other. So um, you can start to have confidence between the ARF original research study, uh, you know, what we saw from uh, Facebook and Simul Media, and here as we look at the, the viewing habits. Um,